A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm PE in uh, Indiana and Ohio. I'm also a board, board certified environmental engineer through the American Academy of Environmental Engineers. Been working in the water and wastewater industry for 20 years after I graduated from Rose Hallman. And I'm an avid uh, clay target shooter. I love to go out and shoot the 12 uh, gauge shotgun and kill the uh, clay pigeons. Tom Smith, Tom, you want to tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm the project manager for Reed and Sons Construction, and I also do the, I'm the chief estimator. Uh, I've got about 24 years of experience. I kind of worked through the trades. I went to Purdue University in the civil engineering and land survey and undergraduate program and uh, worked for different companies as a labor operator in the office. As an owner operator, I had my own business for a while, and now I'm with Reed and Sons. And uh, one of my passions is sports and football and baseball. And I have a 14 year old that uh, went through the process of 10 years of coaching. All right. Thank you, Tom. Dan McVeigh. Dan McVeigh, regional manager with the DN Tanks, formerly Nat Gun Corporation. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that when I do my presentation. But as, as I'm thinking about it, I've been in the industry almost 40 years. I know. You're old. Know. That, that means I have, I'm older than some of the underwear that you, would, you have. So having said that, uh, I cover uh, Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, and I just got blessed with the state of Michigan. So having said that, uh, the only thing that we do is design and construct pre-stressed concrete wire on storage tanks for various applications of storage. Uh, and we have the opportunity of having worked with with Pat on this project, and then and now we're working uh, as a subcontractor with Tom in the construction of the tank. And as Pat's going to take this out there, I wish I wish that we were further along. We've only been on site about a week, so you're going to see a lot of preliminary going on out there as we go out to the site. And we're going to kind of paint a brush as to where we go from here and, and what stage we're in. But we've got some handouts. Uh, once I'll pass those out at break, we're kind of giving an idea as to how the construction process will. We'll go in accordance with what I'm going to talk about in just, uh, in just a little while. Thanks again, Pat, for the opportunity. All right. Well, what we're here today to talk about specifically is a new water tank for the Southwest Bartholomew Water Corporation, and you may hear me refer to it as the SWBWC, just to try to make it a little bit shorter name. And it's, it's called the new State Road 46 tank number two because they already have a 46 tank in uh, operation and you'll see why here in just a little bit. Well, where did this all start? It started in planning a long time ago and basically uh, this section will cover the five-year outlook study uh, the rural development, PER, and the land acquisition process that the utility went through. Timeline. This project has been a long time coming, as I'm sure the utility will attest to. The planning started in the beginning of 2006. We started out with what we called a five-year study. What did the utility need to do over the next five years to make sure that they had uh, sufficient supply and pumping capacity and storage capacity? Well, it took about eight, nine months to get through that process, and that was done in November. Like I said, we looked at transmission capacity, system storage, treatment capacity, and equalization and service area allocations. I have a map over here, and it may be hard to see from your location, but that is a overall map showing the entire water system of Southwest Bartholomew. They serve, uh, I forget, it's close to 100 square miles of surface area and they have six different pressure zones and 
two different water treatment plants and now they have uh, four different booster stations and five tanks and we're adding the sixth. Well, once we had the planning study done, it was a matter of figuring out how are we going to pay for this. Well, it was decided to go for rural development funding. That's what the utility had done in the past. We started a rural development PER in the beginning of 2007 and completed the PER in August 2007. But through the land acquisition process, there was some changes and it was revised again in May, by May 2008. The report follows the standard RD format and there's about seven sections that you'll see in every RD funding PER and that's what you'll see. And right there you'll see a typical TOC from one of those. So if you have to build a tank and you fund it through rural development, you should end up with a PER like this from your engineer. Well, the PER, we basically identified four different projects uh, for completion. The first one being a new transmission main uh, along State Road 46. State Road 46 runs from Columbus out to Nashville and we're about right here but the utility has their water treatment plant back here and it is pumped up to the State Road 46 tank and then it currently flows by gravity to a booster station on 46 that then pumps it out to the Brown County service area. Well the line from that booster station out to that tank was undersized. So this project paralleled that line with a new 8-inch line and increased uh, the capacity of that booster station by about 50 percent without changing anything just by lowering the hydraulic head that it had to push against. Second project identified was the new State Road 46 tank and that was a 300,000 gallon ground storage tank. The State Road uh, 46 service area its current tank is only 100,000 gallons and the demand in that area is over 300,000 gallons a day. So basically the new tank 300 plus 400 or 300 plus 100, 400,000 gallons of storage so that they had their, met their average day demand and had room for growth. Some of the, the other two projects were not in the same area but State Road 58 booster station to supply water to another area of the water system and that was just a package booster station out along State Road 58. And then, oh, you're faster than me, Tom. Then the, the last project, number four, was what we called the new Grandview Grocery Booster Station. And it pumped water from the south system to the Grandview service area. And it also has a capacity to pump from the south system to the north system. The, like I said, the Water Corporation has two water treatment plants at different hydraulic heads, and this station has the capacity to pump from the lower head or hydraulic grade system from the south to the higher hydraulic grade system in the north. Well, the PER had an estimated cost of $2,051,000. Uh, it was broken into what we called Phase 1A and Phase 1B. And Phase 1A was Projects 1, 3, and 4. And those co 
ended up costing $948,200. Phase 2B was estimated at $708,400, or approximately 40% of the cost. And then non-construction cost at around $394,000. That's the meat of the PER. There's a lot of other things that go into it, but due to time constraints, I'm gonna limit it to that. Well, once we had the PER done, then we had to go into land acquisition. How are we gonna get these items put into place? The, three, or the four different projects required these different amounts of land and easements to get them constructed. The new State Road 46 tank was the most difficult because of the type of easements and land we had to get and the property owners we had to deal with. The other sites, uh, the transmission main was about 11,000 feet and we needed a 20 foot easement for that and then we needed about a quarter to a half acre for both of the booster station sites. <coughs> Land acquisition process, what were the site constraints? Well, for the tank, we wanted to build a ground storage tank. We didn't want to put another elevated tank in the air because of operational cost, uh, maintenance cost, and people don't like seeing tanks anymore if they don't have to. So height of the tank, where, or height of the land where we're gonna put the tank, ease of access, minimal environmental impact. Are we gonna to have to clear a bunch of trees, do a ton of uh, erosion control? What's the, what can we do to minimize that? And proximity to the water main. The further you get from your main that you gotta to connect to, the more it costs. The transmission main, mainly where the start and end points that we had to connect to and how can we minimize the distance. The booster stations, making sure we had the co correct hydraulic locations, uh, reasonable proximity to the existing water mains and that they were buildable sites, not too much uh, land slope to deal with. And then on all the components, trying to uh, get land where we had amenable property owners. Well, when you're going through land acquisition, if you're going through federal funding, if you want to use their funds, you've got to go through the, what's called the Uniform Relocation Act, or URA. If you're building a project like this, we highly recommend that you use local funds so you don't have to follow that. There is tons of extra paperwork and all it ends up costing you is time and money. Well, after we got the PER done the first time, we started land acquisition in the summer of 2007. Well, one, uh, projects one, three, and four, we had those acquired by, I think, the end of 2009. Our tank site, we started out with an amenable property owner who basically changed their mind on uh, selling the site. We continued to work with them and tried several times on siting it around their uh, property so that they would be happy and in the end uh, that fell for through. So we didn't delay the other projects, we broke those out and started the next <coughs> phase of bidding and construction for them after we had done, completed the uh, meet and explaining the project of what would need to go on the site, reviewing and negotiating with them, 
and getting their acceptance and transfer of the property and signatures on the easements. So that was done for those first three. <coughs> Project number two, the tank site, turned into a whole heck of a lot more than anybody had ever anticipated. <coughs> we started out with selection and identification. <coughs> We had a great site. It was very close to our booster station. It had the right elevation. It had cleared area on it, and it had access. So it was really the perfect site. Well, we met with them, did the explanation, and reviewed and negotiated from fall 2007 through spring of 2008. That failed. We looked at other sites, but the cost and the impact weren't worth switching. So the utility made the decision to go through condemnation procedures. That was gone through in 2008 through spring of 2009, and then the court case went from fall 2009 until winter 2010 and we had redemption in the end because we won the court case but when you win a uh, condemnation in Indiana it gives you rights to use of the land it does not give you free clear free and clear title to said land so even though we had the right to use it, we didn't have free and clear title, RD would not give us release of funds. We had to uh, settle on the value of the land before the land would be free and clear. Well, we prepared for trial. It went on for quite a while, and then I, within a week before Everybody came to agreement, and there was a settlement finally on the value, and everything was signed off on, and the land was finally free and clear. And then all that remained was getting the paperwork done and that took a while still to get done so we finally got our release in the fall of 2012 well since we had the land condemned we actually started the design and permitting process before we had started the trial process for the value so in this section <coughs> We're going to talk about the design components after the timeline and permitting. All right. Like I said, we started the tank design prior to having the land free and t clear in the winter of 2010. And we were done with the tank design and permitting in June 2011. So we knew we were ready to go to bid as soon as the land was cleared. Design components. Tank, the primary and most important thing with any tank design is two things, size and elevation. So for this tank, we have an existing State Road 46 tank, and they're both in the same hydraulic uh, and pressure plane, so we're matching the overflow elevations. And that then set our base elevation about 20 feet below that, and based on that, we knew a diameter, about 50 foot in diameter, and that generated our 300,000 gallon storage volume. It's kind of hard to see here and what I'm going to do now is pass around a s small set of plans that you're 
welcome to look through while I talk, and you'll see more of the details. But this is our actual tank site. This is our tank. This is our transmission main into it. We've got fencing around it and screening trees, and our access road comes in here. And then for any tank, you're going to have all the appurtenances that go in with it. And in this case, we had a inlet line for creating a cross current in the tank so that we don't have stagnant water. So we discharge in one end of the tank and then we pull out of the other end of the tank. And then we have an overflow elevation. Our site is quite sloped and what we did is dug out the site and you'll see the big hole out there when we go out there. So a majority of the tank's going to be hidden from view in the end. So it's not going to be a tank way up in the air creating a huge eyesore for the property owner. Uh, geotechnical. I didn't mention it earlier, but we had the soil borings and a report generated before we even went into condemnation just to make sure that the site we were going to condemn and bought in the end was suitable to build the tank. The last thing you want to do is buy some land and find out it's not suitable or it's going to be very expensive to build the tank you're going to build. Tank sits up on the hill. Our transmission main is down at State Road 46, about 150 feet below where the tank sits and about 2,000 feet away. So we've got to run about 2,000 feet of transmission main up to it, and that has been done. And there is an existing access road that we followed and an old abandoned road that was cleared of trees that we continued to follow up to the tank site. So we had to minimize clearing of trees. As I said, we go up a ton, and in some areas our grade's greater than 20%, so that our transmission main didn't slide. We put in what are called concrete anchors, basically just chunks of concrete around the pipe that anchor it in place to keep it from shifting. Usually on a critical item like this, we put in ductile iron pipe just so we've got the most heavy duty material and it's uh, le least susceptible to breaks and uh, somebody digging into it. We have Isolation valves and flushing hydrants also. We got a hydrant down at the highway and a hydrant up at the tank. So you can drain the tank either down at the bottom of the hill or up at the top of the hill. Electric and power. This is an isolated area and it's right on the border between uh, REMC and Duke. We did the design, first REMC said it was their territory. We went through, completed the design, then we get out there and apply for uh, the actual uh, meter, and then they renege and say, no, that's no longer, that's not our territory. Then we were forced to switch from uh, REMC to Duke, and when you switch from one company to another power company, they have different standards. So if you have to switch, you're most likely going to have to make changes to your design, and that was our case. Uh, we had to move the metering from up at the tank site down to the power pole down the hill. And that, in the end, cost the utility is costing the utility extra monies because REMC does more work at their own expense versus what Duke will do at their expense. Not comparison of for-profit versus a not-for-profit utility. 
Decide how you're going to run your power. Most of the time we recommend underground power to any tank site so uh, you don't have to deal with any down power lines or overhead power and future maintenance. Appurtenances, tell your engineer where you want any electrical panels or GFCIs and make sure that they put in pull boxes and uh, know where the power poles are going. <coughs> Controls. The utility has a system integrator that they've worked with for close to a decade, Toric, and the project was bid out and they are being used by the general contractor, Reed and Sons, to put in the additional controls to monitor this tank. You need to decide or know, your engineer needs to know what communication type you want to use, be it radio, telephone, or the new, newest version, cellular, if you want. Uh, for Southwest, They've had a uh, licensed radio system so they can have higher powered radios for better communication and we're just continuing that in this scenario. Make sure before they install the system that they have run a what's called a communication radio survey. It's where they go out, set up at where your tank is going to be and communicate to the next site that you need to connect to because if you just install a uh, SCADA panel there and put up an antenna, in the winter when you don't have foliage, you're, as you guys probably know, you may be great. Then as soon as spring comes on, the foliage all comes out, communication deteriorates greatly because all that foliage blocks that. And then make sure your, your engineer knows what you want accumulated from the tank site. In this case, all we're doing out here is connect monitoring the water level so that it's communicated back to the water treatment plant so we know when to turn the uh, pumps on and off. Ancillary items. It's kind of difficult to see, but this is our tank site uh, right here. 46 runs here. Our transmission main runs up. This is the road that goes to the top of the hill right here. This is an old road, so our transmission main ran up it, but we ran our new road up and around and over to the tank site. Uh, we always recommend a, a fence around the tank so, so you, you can secure the site so you minimize your vulnerabilities. I'm assuming everybody here has done their vulnerability assessment as required. And in this case, we're putting a bunch of screening trees around the site to minimize the view of the tank to the property owner. This property is, it's an old farm and the property owner bought it as a camp retreat and in our negotiations one of the things that we did was said we'll screen the site so you minimize view of the tank. And with the way we situated the tank, it, on site it won't be more than about 10 to 15 feet above ground. So the screenings will pretty much cover the full tank site once they've grown uh, 10 to 15 foot. In this case, we're using, huh? Uh, on the high end, about 15 feet, and on the low end of the grade, about five to 10 feet. So it's basically, once the tank is installed, you'll, there'll be a grade through the tank. And what we did was put it back pretty much to existing grade so it, it just falls natural contours of the land. I didn't mention it earlier, but when you do an RD 
preliminary engineering report, there's an ancillary report that goes along with that. It's called the environmental report. To get any federal <coughs> funding nowadays, you have to do an ER, as you'll hear it referred to a lot of the times. And what comes out of that ER is what are called the mitigation measures. And those are the things you have to do when you're doing the construction to minimize how you impact the environment to the site and the surrounding areas. And here, there's a list of all those that we had to deal with on this project. Land use, luckily, we're in an isolated area, so there wasn't anything to deal with there. It's not farmland, but if you're building in a farm field, if you take up so much area nowadays, there is mitigation that you do have to do. Classified lands, if you're building on a brown field or any other known contaminated site or reusing it, there may be additional requirements on that. Flood plains, in this case, our site is about 150 foot above the nearest flood plain, so that's not an issue, but what you'll always see out of DNR is they want you to bore any streams or creeks or rivers nowadays, and, and if you can't, put it back to its natural condition afterwards. Best management practices. This is where you get into the Rule 5 erosion control requirements, making sure you've got up your erosion control fences and you aren't discharging tons of sediment down into the streams. Wetlands, sites way above, but we avoid wetlands almost at all costs nowadays just because if you take out uh, a part of one part of wetlands that you remove, you have to replace it. It's either four or five to one ratio. So stay away from wetlands if at all possible. Cultural resources. If you're doing a project next to historic structures, they're gonna to wanna to make sure that you aren't creating an eyesore. And this luckily is out in the middle of nowhere and there is no cultural, <coughs> biological, we're not in any known or hugely sensitive area. Biological, main thing you see the comment in Indiana is the Indiana bat. And water quality issues. This sort of goes along with the erosion control, making sure you aren't putting uh, soils into the streams. Socioeconomic environmental justice, making sure that you aren't displacing low income or causing tons of economic turmoil in the area. Air quality, in this case, it's just making sure that we aren't creating tons of dust, you wet the surfaces, and that you have exhaust mufflers to we're not in a coastal region, so that wasn't applicable. Transportation, we were crossing NDOT, so we had to get an NDOT permit. And lastly, noise, making sure mainly that you have mufflers on all the construction equipment and you're only working during the day and they don't want you to blast anymore if you don't have to. So those are all the environmental impacts that we had to make sure were addressed through the design. Oh, make sure your contractor has a portalette or some means of sanitary facilities and that they have a dumpster or something so that you're not leaving debris all around the site. Ah, permitting, well, you get through at addressing all those, your design is pretty well done. 
We worked closely with the utility to make sure that all their comments, desires, and needs were addressed in the final design, and we went off to the permitting agencies for permitting. NDOT, our transmission main to get to the site had to cross uh, underneath their road, so we did get an NDOT right-of-way permit. We worked closely with the uh, local district of Seymour to get that, and NDOT we find pretty easy to work with generally as long as you're doing nothing out of the ordinary. That was not a problem. IDEM, we got the standard uh, construction permit from them and that also went pretty smoothly. County, since we weren't in any county roads and we were beyond the juris jurisdiction of the county, we didn't really have to deal with them in this project, which was nice. Erosion control, uh, the original project, we got an erosion control permit, so we already had one for that. 